The Bible and slavery. Let's begin with R. Joseph Hoffman, an atheistic historian. He's writing out of Prometheus Press. This is the equivalent of like a Christian fundamentalist press, only it's an atheistic fundamentalist press. What the Bible really says about all these different subjects, well, with regard to slavery, he writes this, quote, there is no reasonable doubt that the New Testament, like the Old, not only tolerated chattel slavery, chattel meaning property, slave is property, but helped to perpetuate it by making the slaves obedience to their masters a religious duty. This biblical morality was one of the greatest handicaps that the emancipation movement in the United States had to overcome. The Bible was the thorn in the side of emancipation for black slaves in the United States. That's his argument. And it's because the Bible not just tolerated slavery, but said that you ought to obey your masters. Here's some of the writing of John Henry Hopkins, one of the polemicists for slavery in the 1860s, 1864. Here's his argument. I don't know if you've ever read any of this literature. It's pretty vile. The Bible's defense of slavery is very plain. St. Paul was inspired and knew the will of the Lord Jesus Christ and was only intent on teaching it. Who are we that in our modern wisdom presume to set aside the Word of God and scorn the example of the divine Redeemer? and spurn the preaching and the conduct of the apostles, and invent for ourselves a higher law than that of the Holy Scriptures. Paul taught it. Paul got this from Jesus. What, are we just going to throw out the Bible and get rid of the Bible? Otherwise, if we do that, well, then we don't even believe in slavery anymore because we're getting rid of the Bible. Who are we to virtually blot out the language of the sacred record and dictate to the majesty of heaven that he shall regard as sin and reward as duty. Here's my question, right off the bat. If the Bible truly supports slavery, why did they print a slave Bible in 1807? You say, what's the slave Bible, James? Glad you asked. The official book title was Parts of the Holy Bible Selected for the Use of Negro Slaves in the British West India Islands. 90% of the Old Testament was cut out. Half of the New Testament was cut out. That quote-unquote Bible, writes Copan, included Joseph's enslavement in Egypt. It had that part in there. But it omitted Israel's liberation from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So this Bible that is so nefarious and so evil that it would promote slavery and actually not just tolerate it, but promote it, and it was the thing that stopped emancipation, if that's the case, why were they afraid of black slaves getting that Bible in their hands? And instead, they had to have a slave Bible that was completely excised and cut apart to make it seem like slavery is actually a good thing. Only when you cut apart the Bible can you make a case that the Bible supports slavery. I'm going to argue here that when you read the Bible, not just sola scriptura, the Bible alone, but tota scriptura, reading the entirety of Bible, that you get the picture of what the Bible teaches about slavery. To begin, we're going to start with New Testament slavery. And just to make a couple of qualifications, this isn't entirely that significant but I do want to clear up a little bit of uh, misunderstanding. Roman slavery in the first century world, the world in which the New Testament was written, isn't the same as antebellum slavery in the South. Uh, antebellum, before the war, Civil War. The way that slavery was practiced before the Civil War is not equal to Roman slavery. I'll give you just a few differences. Roman slavery, the, one, the type of slavery that Paul and Peter were writing about, wasn't based on uh, race. It was based on class. It was classist, not racist. So if you were taken in, it was because you were poor or you were captured by another country, uh, captured by Rome, and you brought in, and you were a lower class, not based on race. Number two, many of those who were enslaved 
were educated. The slaves were doctors, in some cases uh, lawyers, nurses, teachers. Think of Galatians 3.24, that the law has become our pedagogos, our pedagogy, our tutor, to lead us to Christ. But the law is called a slave, a slave teacher, a tutor. You'd have tutors in the ancient world that were that were slaves that would teach children how to read and write and learn and uh, philosophize. Epictetus, one of the great philosophers, actually became a philosopher after he was enslaved. So education, medicine, food, shelter, clothing, all of these things were afforded to slaves. Are there exceptions? Yes. I'm not painting with a broad brush in the sense that all of Roman slavery was educating slaves, and that's not true, okay? Was there assault and attacks on slaves by masters? Yes. Was it an evil institution? Yes, it was. Absolutely. I don't like when people say, well, Roman slavery was different. It was different. It doesn't mean it was good. It was evil. But it's not the same as what we picture when we hear the word slave or slavery. In Roman slavery, slaves were under contract, so to speak. They could buy themselves out of slavery through a practice called manumission. Manumission. So if you were, I think the criterion was you needed to be 30, you needed to be working with your slave master, you had the money, you were under contract, it had been so many years, you could buy your freedom. Now, obviously, none of this was true for slavery in the antebellum South. So again, let me reiterate, I'm giving you a general picture I'm not saying every slave was treated this way. I'm also not saying, oh, slavery wasn't that bad, right? It, wrong. It was bad. It was terrible. I'm just saying it's different. So, all right. That being said, now that I got that off my chest, what do we do with New Testament slavery? Number one, we need to understand the cultural context in which the statements of the New Testament are given. I'm thinking of 1 Peter 2, Colossians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 6, and so forth. What does it mean when the New Testament writers are writing into a culture where slavery was just considered a fact? Well, I'd like to give you an illustration. Here is a book by Mark Twain called Huck Finn, Huckleberry Finn, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This book is banned in many high schools today. Do you know why? Because it's racist. That's why. Because Huck Finn repeatedly refers to his friend Jim, a black man, with the racial epithet of the N-word. It's all throughout the book. And that racist, Mark Twain, I mean, he just can't get enough of using the N-word to describe Jim. Okay, So it's a racist book, and we don't read it today because it's racist. That's today. Did you know that when Mark Twain originally wrote that book, it was considered incredibly progressive for its day to the point where people shouldn't read it because it was so anti-racist. <laughs> How do you figure? I think when we saw the word being used all throughout it, it was considered progressive by Mark Twain because a young white boy is friends with an older black man. They're friends. Now, does it use racial slurs to describe them? Yes, it does. Is that wrong? Yes, it is. But in the context in which Dwayne wrote that, that needs to be considered. It was considered progressive back then. It's considered regressive today. What I'm arguing here is the New Testament, in its day, wasn't regressive. In the New Testament era, it was incredibly progressive. Uh, when it comes to politics, are you a progressive or a conservative? A uh, trick question. As a Christian, you should know what things need to be progressed and move past. I hope in the 1860s you'd be a progressive, right? You'd be moving past those things, progressing. In other areas, you should say, no, we're not progressing in that area. We should conserve, keep things the way that they are. And those things are good and ought not to change. This is what we're faced with here when we look at the New Testament's view of slavery. W.L. Westerman was a very iconic uh, ancient historian. 
uh, historian of uh, antiquity, I should say, he says this, quote, the institution of slavery was a fact of Mediterranean economic life, so completely accepted as part of the labor structure of the time that no one can correctly speak of the slave problem in antiquity. There was no problem in the ancient mind when it came to slavery. It was just a fact of reality. In fact, there was only one group that opposed slavery in the ancient world. Well, two groups. First group were the slaves. The second group were the Christians. Those were the two groups that opposed slavery in any sort of meaningful way. Of course, you had uh, a Seneca here or there that would say, I don't think this is quite right. This kind of makes my skin crawl what's happening here. But as far as groups speaking out against slavery, you got the slaves and you got the Christians. How about as far back as Aristotelian thinking in the 4th century, Aristotle says, quote, the manager of a household must have his tools. Some tools are lifeless and others are living. A slave is a living article of property. Like some tools, like your hammer and your, your Phillips, your channel locks, your power drill, you know, th those are, well, inanimate, you know, lifeless. But then you got your, your live uh, tools, you know, like people, like slaves, actual people. Again, Aristotle, slaves are as different as the soul from the body or man from beast. They are slaves by nature. We maltreat them, writes Seneca. He's writing about the, the, the context of his day, just the, the, the setting, the cultural setting. The script of the day was, we maltreat them not as if they were men, but as if they were beasts of burden. We are excessively haughty, cruel, and insulting. Now, Seneca is no saint, but he's looking out at the culture and just saying, this, this is wrong. This is not right, because it was so common in his day. Now, some people say, the New Testament is um, countercultural, as we'll see, as we'll see. But it should have gone farther. Well, like what? I mean, it gives slaves the dignity of being equal. It tells slaves to get their freedom if they can get it. It gives every person value. It makes slaves brothers with their masters. It, I mean, we could go on and on and on and on. But people say, no, 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 it should have gone further than that. Like what? Like revolt like resistance. Why doesn't the Bible teach that if you're in an unjust system like, like slavery, Roman chattel slavery, that you should get out and revolt at something like that? Did you know that if you were to hop in some sort of a Marty McFly time machine and you were to go back and speak to the slaves at the time and you told them that idea, hey, why don't you guys just revolt? You know what they would say to you? Wow. We never thought of that before. God, thank God we got you coming from the future telling us to revolt. Otherwise, we never would have had the precious ideas of the 21st century coming back for us. Revolt! Resist! That's what we should do. They tried it! They tried it! History tells us anything. How about the Jewish war? We don't want to pay taxes to Caesar. We don't want to have any idols set up anymore. We're sick of this. And they revolted. And in the Jewish war, over a period of four years... 1.1 million Jews were killed and 200,000 were enslaved. When you go up against Rome, uh, you're going to pay the price. Now, historians believe Josephus was exaggerating with those numbers. 1.1 million, that's a lot of people. Whatever the figure was, it was huge. It was enormous. And the people that were carted off into slavery was just uh, unspeakable. What about the Spartacus revolt, slave revolt, 73 BC? Maybe you've seen the movie, not Michael Douglas, Kirk Douglas, the dad. Great film, great movie. That was the Braveheart before Braveheart, Spartacus the movie. And at the end of the movie, I hate to give it away, Kirk Douglas is up there on that crucifix. What happens when you go up against Rome? You go down. That's what happens. 6,000 of the survivors of the Spartacus revolt were crucified. 30,000 were killed. Others were taken into slavery. There was no revolt. There was no resistance. What about number two? The New Testament decries slave trading. Paul states the kidnappers are, quote, lawless and rebellious. Lawless and rebellious. That is, that is an indicting statement against kidnappers. We say, yeah, kidnappers. You wouldn't want to capture a kid. That'd be pretty evil. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. What's a kidnapper? 
kidnapper, Andra Podistai. Andros meaning man, Podistai, um, uh, podiatrist, foot, man on foot. Uh, essentially what this word means is one who acquires persons for use by others, a slave dealer or a kidnapper. Capturing another person. Or think of, is it Revelation 18, verse 23, somewhere in that realm. You'll probably get close. It refers to those who carry off as cargo human suke, human souls, bodies, that they're trading lives. Forgot to put that in there. Romans, uh, Revelation 18, 23-ish. They take away human bodies. So the New Testament decries kidnapping people. Right there. Right there. We should have given that to John Henry Hopkins. That one principle was followed. That one right there. That would have virtually eliminated chattel slavery in the antebellum South. Because how would those slaves have gotten here? They were kidnapped. Now whoever's culpable for that and the culpability was spread over many people, everyone had their hands dirty with that. Doesn't matter. Those people are lawless and rebellious according to the Apostle Paul. Three, the New Testament urges slaves to get their freedom. 1 Corinthians 7.21, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can get your freedom, do so. Verse 23, do not become slaves of men. Do not become slaves of men. Do not become slaves of men. Well, the Bible not only tolerated slavery, but actually promoted it. Do not become slaves of men. Get your freedom if you can. Here's the problem. They couldn't. They couldn't. What, you just go down to the, the, the BMV and you apply for your freedom? Is that how it works? It doesn't work that way. They had to, this was a whole process of manumission, saving up the money, being a certain age, getting out from under this cruel tyranny of slavery. Here's R. Joseph Hoffman once again. He says, but Jesus never attacked the practice. Now, this is a historian here, right? And he's writing a book called What the Bible Says. Okay, historian, PhD, what the Bible really says. Let's see what he says. Jesus never attacked the practice. If Jesus had denounced slavery, we should almost certainly have heard of his doing so. First of all, Jesus was in Israel. This wasn't in the greater province of Rome. And Rome let the Israelites do and lead the way that they wanted to do and lead. They had their own laws. They took a very laissez-faire approach and said, you can lead. Was there slavery in Israel? Yes, of a different kind, as we're going to see. We're going to get to Old Testament slavery. Technically, Jesus was leading and living under the Old Testament. We'll get to that. But Jesus never attacked the practice of Roman slavery somewhere that he had never been, never been to Rome. He had never traveled the places that Paul traveled. But Jesus never attacked the practice of slavery? Answer, yes, he did. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, citing Isaiah chapter 61. The Lord has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the oppressed will be set free. Read it and weep, Hoffman. It's right there. How do you miss the primary source itself? What the Bible really says. There it is, right there. That's what the Bible really says. How do you miss that? you got to want to miss that. That text is staring you right in the face. If you're going to make a statement that Jesus never said it, would you read the four Gospels? Would you do that? And if you do it, will you read the part where it says that he's going to proclaim that the captives be released? He pressed it free? All right. What about this? Luke 6, 27. Love your enemies. Oh, <laughs> see? Classic Jesus. He's wanting, people, he's wanting people to be oppressed by their enemies. That's what Jesus is into. Do good to those who hate you. See, Jesus is all about letting people that hate you take control of your life and abuse you. That's what it's saying right there. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Yeah. See, Jesus was, he was fond. Jesus was fond of cursing. And so he wants to bless people when they curse you. He, he approves of that. Pray for those who hurt you. See, Jesus would agree with anyone who's being abused and hurt. And he actually says, well, all you got to do is just pray it away. Verse 29, if someone slaps you on the one cheek, offer the other cheek also. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. Do you see how absurd that interpretation is? Jesus isn't approving of cursing or hurting or slapping. He's saying that's evil. The question is, what do you do about it? When it comes to not to civil ethics, but interpersonal ethics, 
What do you do when somebody slaps you across the face? This would be an insult. It doesn't say punch. doesn't say stab. What do you do when somebody insults you, curses you, persecutes you? He says, you love the person. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. The golden rule. Other religions put that in the negative. This is unique. The silver rule is do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you. We see that throughout world religion. It's unique to Jesus to put this into the positive. Do to others. So you could follow the silver rule and do nothing. Do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. The golden rule actually tells you to go out and love other people. That was Jesus' ethic. If we follow Jesus' ethic in Luke 6.31, that would abolish slavery entirely right there. You just have to ignore the teaching of Jesus to do so. Number four, the New Testament affirms the value and equality of all human persons. Galatians 3.28. Oh, what a powerful verse. There is neither Jew nor Greek. So that would be ethnic differences. There is neither slave nor free. Classism. There is neither male nor female. Sexism. But you are all one in Christ. So here are the big issues dividing our society today and and indeed the world. Classism, racism, and sexism. And piercing through that are the nails of the cross that say that we are all one in Christ. That is the ultimate leveler that we're all brought into Christ, made in the image of God. That every human person is so valuable, no matter what they can do for us, no matter what skin color, no matter what gender, it doesn't matter what they can produce for us. Every person is so valuable that Christ himself died for them. So that's something different we don't see in uh, extra biblical religion or philosophy. And finally, number five, the New Testament ethic led to abolition. The New Testament ethic led to abolition. Let's read from some historians here. Here's Mark Knoll. He's a leading church historian. Knoll's work is highly respected. He writes this, The first known American protest to slavery appeared in 1688. From whom? Quakers and Mennonites at Germantown, Pennsylvania. To the extent that a protest existed at this time, it was mounted by secular humanists. It was mounted by Roman historians. It was mounted by religious leaders. This was the first cadre of people that stood up and said, this is wrong. And we're not going to stand for it. We don't want this in our society. J. Gordon Melton writes this. He says, the Clapham sect, this sect of Christians, was a diverse but influential group of evangelical Christian social reformers that emerged in England at the end of the 18th century. The group became best known for its support of a little-known man by the name of William Wilberforce in his activity in Parliament to end British participation in the international slave trade. You know what historians call what Wilberforce did? They refer to it as econocide. To say, we're going to get rid of the international slave trade, I believe in 1833, somewhere around there. On his deathbed, William Wilberforce heard They put an end to it and went through Parliament. We won. To say we're getting rid of our free labor kills the economy. It's an economy killer. It's econocide. They supported William Wilberforce in doing this. After several decades of work, the group was initially rewarded with Parliament's passage of the Slave Trade Act in 1807, which banned the trade throughout the British Empire. Their efforts culminated in the passing, oh, it is, there it is, of the Slavery Abolition Act in 1833, which eliminated slavery throughout the British Empire. Many contemporaries looked upon the Clapham sect as a bunch of do-gooders whom they called pejoratively, insultingly, the saints. (laughs) In light of history, however, the group has been looked upon as moral pioneers. What about Old Testament slavery? I put this in quotes. Slavery, Old Testament slavery, quote-unquote. I don't think this should be considered slavery. It's a shame, in my opinion, that in our English translations, usually the term is translated slave. 
the word abad in Hebrew should normally, in most contexts, be translated servant. Now, there's cases where it should be translated slave. Pharaoh, when he took the people of Israel in Egypt as abad, they were slaves. They weren't servants of Pharaoh. They were straight up slaves. That's, that's systemic slavery. However, normally the term used, at least in Israel, is indentured servant. You're giving yourself to someone to work for them and to work off a debt. This derives, just to, just to show this, the word abad, servant or slave, however we translate that, comes from the root word abad, which just means to work, a worker. Now, are they a worker with rights or a worker without rights? Or a better question would be, what sort of rights do they have? And a bed is just a servant. The original 1611 King James Bible used the word, or rather translated the word abed as slave only once to refer to Israel or to refer to an Israelite in Jeremiah chapter 2. That's in 1611. I have no idea why modern translations continue to put the word slave when it refers to an Israelite who's working for a family in the civil law. I honestly have no idea. Copan has a long chapter on it and has got a vindictive bully. You can read him. I don't think he has any idea. It's, it's pretty befuddling. I, I really don't know. Moses is called the abed of God. Joshua is called the abed of God. It doesn't mean slave. Numbers 12, you know, I speak to them in visions and I speak to them in dreams, but, but with Moses, I speak to him face to face as one man speaks to a friend. That's not slavery. Joshua, the servant of the Lord. Hey, while we're at it, you know who else is called the abed of the Lord? Jesus. Jesus, Isaiah 52, 13. The servant songs use the word abed. All right, that being said, what can we say about Old Testament, quote-unquote, slavery? First of all, I would like to propose that we say indentured servitude. Number one, indentured servitude is what we're talking about here, was voluntary. You couldn't go and capture somebody and make them your slave. That did not exist. You, you couldn't do that in... Now, when there was a war, the options were to put the person to death or to have them in as workers. Uh, in that case, I guess that would be slavery. The alternatives were slim. There's two alternatives at that point. They didn't have prisons. You couldn't send them away. What do you do? Put them in a boat? Send them to the other side of the Atlantic? You either have them work for you uh, because they're attacking your nation, or you put them to death, one or the other. But in the civil society, if somebody was there, you could not just go up to a free person, not a criminal, not a, a combatant in war, and make them your slave. You could not do that. Leviticus 25, verse 39, if any of your fellow servant, or rather, rather, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, do not make them work as slaves. They are to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you. They are to work for you until the year of Jubilee. So they're not to be mistreated. This is voluntary. This is something that they choose to do but they're working until their debts are paid off in the year of Jubilee. Second, poverty could be avoided. We already studied this. We saw that, for one, there were no interests on loans for Israelites, and there was free food. Remember Ruth and the Moabitess went through and gathered and gleaned off the, the crop? There was a three-year tithe to the poor. So poverty could be avoided. Here's the three-step process in Leviticus 25. That's all you got to remember. Leviticus 25. Number one, if you were going into poverty, an Israelite could mortgage their land. I've got land. I'm going to sell part of that off. Remember, you get that back every 50 years in the year of Jubilee. But hey, we're in dire straits. I'll sell it off to somebody with more money. If that doesn't work, you could take an interest-free loan. Leviticus 25. But what if you try and get a loan and you can't pay it back and you've mortgaged land and that's not working? If you were going to become destitute, you could sell yourself as an indentured servant. There was no such thing as bankruptcy. You didn't file for bankruptcy. What you did is you sold your property 
or you took a loan that was interest-free, or you said, I'm going to work and attach myself to a family. And, and if you read these laws, you see that the relationship is congenial, it's amicable. In fact, uh, if you want to join the family permanently, you can choose to do so. Number three, debts were released every seven years. We studied that already. Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15. So if you fell into poverty, those debts every seven years were released. That's why indentured servants were released every seven years. That's why it coincides that way in the law. Moreover, every slave or servant was given moral value. As early as the book of Job, which if you were to ask me, I date is the earliest book in the Hebrew canon. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, it's early. There's no Jews in the book of Job. There's no temple in the book of Job. There's no reference to... Uh, that's a whole other story. Anyways, Job goes way, 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 way back. In Job 31.13, it says, If I have been unfair to my male or female servants when they brought their complaints to me, how could I face God just for being unfair to a servant? Verse 14, What could I say when God questioned me? For God created both me and He created my servants. He created us both in the womb. Huh, that's almost like uh, Genesis 127, like being made in the image of God. So much so that if you kill someone made in the image of God, you lose your life. Genesis 9 6. So this is very costly. Every person, now in the ancient Near East, again, slaves were chattel, they were property, they were objects. This whole idea that a slave is considered someone with value doesn't exist at the culture at the time. They also had legal rights. Exodus 21, verse 26, if a man hits his slave in the eye and the eye is blinded, he must let the slave go free to compensate for the eye. Or if a man knocks out the tooth of his male or female slave, he must let the slave go to free to compensate for the tooth. If this was followed in the antebellum South, slavery would have been abolished. So if, if you hurt someone's eye or their tooth, they're free by law. That, uh, this is unknown. This, now, is it saying that you should knock out the tooth or the eye of a slave? No, these are case laws, remember? If this happens, what do you do? What do you do if a master attacks a slave? Well, this is what you do. You let that, that person go. They've got no debt. You just totally screwed up. Because uh, this person was working for you, you flew off the handle, and now, yeah, they lost their eye or whatever, but they're set free, uh, irrevocably. Finally, forced slavery was a capital crime. Forced, as in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, to be a kidnapper that was lawless and rebellious. I wonder where Paul got that. Got it right here from the Old Testament. It was a capital crime in the Old Testament to capture a person. And in fact, you had to harbor runaways. What is that? Deuteronomy 24, verse 7, uh, 23. Deuteronomy 23. If a runaway servant comes to your house, you are commanded to harbor them and take care of them. Well, let's wrap up here. How can we bring all this together? A lot of material. If we were to communicate this very concisely, I would say this. If the Bible is pro-slavery, why did they print a slave Bible in 1807? What do you do with that? I, I, cutting out 90% of the Old Testament, you know that cruel, barbaric, regressive Old Testament that we shouldn't believe in, that cruel God of the Old Testament? That, why did they cut out 90% of it? Why did they cut out half of the New Testament? We didn't even get into the book of Philemon. You should read that little letter, one chapter letter, how Paul handles this whole delicate subject of slavery. Clearly, the Bible is not pro-slavery, but this was the impetus to release a, uh, a cultural movement that actually gave people dignity, value, and legal rights. If the antebellum South, pre-Civil War South, applied these biblical principles, this would have virtually abolished slavery. 
you can't capture African slaves. Back up. You can't capture African people, turn them into slaves, carry them across the Atlantic, and sell them to others. That would be a ca- Anyone who does that should be put to death according to the Bible. The Bible tells me so. And once they're here, if that person is harmed in any significant way, an eye, a tooth, that person is set free. Every person is a human person made in the image of God. I mean, to, to be a John Henry Hopkins and to say with a straight face that the Bible supports slavery is uh, nothing short of absurd. Now, does it say that slaves need to obey masters? Yes. Why? So that the doctrine of our God will not be tarnished. That's why. Because we're trying to win those slave masters. And eventually, this is exactly what did happen. Many, Christ, many slave masters came to faith in Christ and their hearts were changed from within and lives were changed without. Another one-liner, I guess you could say it, is uh, the problem with Christian slave owners in the South was not that they were applying the Bible too much, but that they were applying it too little. 